delighted to welcome Craig Chalquist, who is the chair of the East-West Psychology Program and uh, also uh, is, has just developed a new certificate in, what is it? It's Applied mythology. Applied mythology, right, through the East-West Psychology Department. And whenever Craig uh, speaks about uh, tarot psychology or sort of the, the linkages between psychology and myth and sort of deeper aspects of being and how we're influenced by the earth and the, the streets that we walk on and the history of the places underneath us. I feel so moved and inspired and changed and it's been a dream of mine to bring him to a class in the MFA, realized as many of our dreams have been by this class, which seemed like the perfect opportunity to look at the parapsychology of the Black Rock Desert. Um, so I'll just introduce uh, Craig's uh, just a brief bio, just to give you a sense, and if you want to take any notes on books of his, they're so deliciously titled. Um, they include Parapsychology, Reengaging the Soul of Place, mm. Edges, Peaks, and Values, A Mythocartography of California at the Margins, Rebirths, Conversations with the World and the Soul, and the spectacle of ourselves, a chronology of key events in world history from the Big Bang to 2012, um, in addition to many other books. So without further ado, I give you Craig Shelfless. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you for inviting me here. And um, I was wondering if I could get a copy of the handouts. <laughs> ah, good, thank you. Great. We might have time to even go through some of these. But at any rate, I wanted you to have them um, so you could take them home later. So I thought what I would do in the hour that I have is more or less divided into three parts. And there's a lot to cover, so I might gallop a little bit. If I gallop too fast, then just wave at me and I'll slow down, uh, or I'll try to anyway. But um, So the first part, I wanted to talk about this thing called terror psychology and what it has to do with um, the soul of place. Secondly, I wanted to talk about myth. Because myth is, well, it's a lot of different things. There's been tons of theories about it for centuries. But um, I think it's also a link to place. And I'll explain that momentarily. And then the third thing I wanted to do is focus especially on <coughs> Burning Man at Black Rock and see what we can do with that. And this part's uh, pretty experimental. So I'm, I'm going to be eager to hear what you actually have to say when you go there. Because I've never been there. So this is all from, it. that part's from a distance. Um, but I do have a pretty good track record <laughs> of kind of guessing what's happening mythically and terrapsychologically at places I haven't been to. So we'll see if that holds up. This may be the one, the one time it crashes, so we'll, we'll find out. <laughs> but um, it would be an appropriate place, as we'll find out, for something to kind of rupture. Um, so first, the terrapsych piece. <clears throat> um, when I was a doctoral student, um, I kept... I kept having dreams about San Diego, which is where I was living and where I was born. And um, it, would, it would take too long to go into it, but I was, I was in a relationship for a while that had some stressors in it that puzzled both me and my partner. And when she and I decided to go our separate ways, I found out afterwards that a lot of the struggles that we had had paralleled historical events in San Diego, which stunned me. Um, so that was the beginning of that work for me. And so I was calling up my dissertation advisor and I was asking her, is there anything that looks at these kinds of parallels? Because I'm now looking into the circumstances of my birth in the city and I'm finding more stuff. Um, so what is up with that? <clears throat> and she said, I don't know, you should talk to, oh, some eco-psychology people. That was the first time I ever heard that word. You should talk to indigenous people. Um, native Californian people and see what they have to say. So I did that. Um, she had a couple of other suggestions too. So, um, God, that was a while ago. This all started for me in about the year 2000, I think it was. And um, between then and now, I have been over all of California listening in to places in every single county, <clears throat> all the large cities and a lot of the small ones. And what I do, and it's, I'll mention it on a handout that I just gave you, is I'm looking for how the, the landscape itself, including what's built in it, shows up as a voice, or actually as many voices, in the lives of the people who live there, in the way that it did for me as well. So other people have done this. 
Um, that's the basic idea behind terror psychology is to trace these parallels. And I can give you an example of it, or a couple of examples, pretty readily. Um, so part of my frustration when I started all this was the eco um, science that I was looking at um, had a lot to do with things like um, how much slower people walk on a cloudy day, you know, those kinds of connections, or air pollution and mental health. And I was completely uninterested in that kind of stuff, at least at that time. Um, I, I am interested now in environmental justice. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> that to me seemed too simplistic. And so I recognized that to understand the connections I was seeing, I would need something that goes deeper than simple cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And that really it's in the humanities that I need to look to the tools for doing this, especially interpretive tools. So the basic idea is to interpret the features of a place like you would interpret a dream. And that takes craft and intuition and creativity. And like a dream, no place is ever um, finished by one interpretation. There are multiple ways of seeing these places. So the, the relatively simple examples I mentioned, the questions I was asking was, how do, for instance, congested freeways show up in congested communications of the people who live there? Why is it that when we look, for, some of us anyway, when we look for the spiritual heights, we go up on top of mountains to meditate? Um, Maslow even called them peak experiences. Why is it that the valleys always seem better for really getting down into low places, depressions, death, heavy thoughts, things like that? Um, why is it that so many writers choose to live near rivers and streams? Um, I noticed when I was doing all, a lot of the, of the writing that I did, um, I was wondering why I was kind of, uh, it felt a little bit manic. <laughs> you know, I was just writing all the time that I had free time. And then I realized there was a creek right in back of where I was living. And I thought, this must have something to do with it, you know. <clears throat> so then when I moved again, I, lived in I live in West Berkeley now. I was lucky enough to land without really intending it, not too far from Strawberry Creek, but also in a neighborhood <laughs> full of streets that are named after writers. <laughs> so, it, you know, if you're a writer, that's kind of a, you know, a blessing, <laughs> or at least inspiration. So, um, a couple more examples to, to kind of center this. Um, if you think about a place like Los Angeles, <laughs> which pff, millions of years ago, was underneath the Pacific Ocean. And so what we now see on a map is the LA Basin. If, you, if you've ever looked at it before, it looks a little bit like a stage or like that clamshell that Venus rides, you know. And it kind of started out that way because millions of years ago, because of tectonic activity off of what's now the coast of California, that stage rose rotating upward through the Pacific Ocean <clears throat> until it broke the water and then some odd million years after that, the Tongva people who were native to that place began collecting there, using it for ceremonial smokes of different kinds. They would also pound jimson weed and have visions there. So LA, long before Hollywood, <laughs> long before the European settlers got there, was a meeting ground for native people all over California so they could come and have visions. So later, when the Padres walked in, <clears throat> they actually gave it kind of an ironic name. The full name of Los Angeles translates roughly as the small portion of land known as um, Los Angeles, the Angels. It's a much bigger portion now, of course, but um, that, that image of the angel rising and falling in Los Angeles, a lot of people resonate to that, especially those of us who've lived in the city itself. <clears throat> and angels are messengers. So if you look through that whole span of time, you can see an unconscious discourse between people and place, even down to what the place is named. Mm -hmm. So it's as though the features, the ecological features, because it starts with the land, it shows up in artistic activity, in politics, in civic adventures of different kinds, um, all kinds of things. It works basically like an unconscious, only it's the unconscious of the earth. Mm -hmm. So terror psychology is a way of tracing these parallels. So there, there's a brief bit about TerraPsych. Um, a couple other examples. I was um, trying to talk to my parents about this <laughs> when I was studying it. And um, <laughs> my dad says, 
Well, what, give me a, you know, he likes the breakdown. He's, he's what Jung called a sensei type. He wants the facts, right, which is great. He said, what is this that you're doing? You know, <laughs> what, what's terror psychology? And I said, let me give you an example. And I said, um, so you have, you and mom have lived in California for a lo much longer than I have. But I was born here, and it makes a difference. So think about that span of years when I was a starving doctoral student. And you always used to freak out that I had so little money to play with. I mean, I, would, I was basically without a, a steady job for the, the years that I worked on my dissertation, <clears throat> which I wrote in a tool shed above the Channel Islands. Um, I made a deal with somebody, and I did landscaping for her, and I carpeted the tool shed and put a bed in it and ran a power line into it. So that's where I wrote my dissertation. You know, you do what you need to do, right? But I never really worried about it. Um, it got anxious now and then. I mean, when you realize that you haven't eaten for a week or whatever, it starts to really get at you. I was never seriously poor. I was never way down in the streets, but I was kind of on the edge, you know. And so my parents were just, oh, how can you do that, you know? And I said, well, I think I have an answer for you. Um, and it's different from just what my psychology is and all that. And I said, see, if you think about where you live, California is the youngest part of this continent, geologically. <clears throat> we, the coastline used to be around Nevada. And so through millions of years, as the, the uh, North, the North uh, uh, excuse me, American plate moved, it scraped up island arcs. So this whole state is pretty much geological driftwood compared to the rest of the country. So the granite here is much younger than the granite on the East Coast, for instance which has a whole different feel. I remember the first time I saw the Thimble Islands <clears throat> out near um, Connecticut, and I thought, no Californian would ever build houses 100 feet up from the ocean like that, you know? We would just expect a tsunami to come in and push everything off, you know? So that, that's one part of it, that the, the youth of this place, geologically speaking. Add to that that we also have a fault line running through the, pretty much the whole state, <clears throat> named after the guy who was pulled apart and martyred. So it's kind of an appropriate name for a fault line that's doing the same thing to the state. It's actually splitting the state in half. So this is, if you translate all, everything that I'm saying and much more besides <clears throat> into the psychology of the people who live here, then it's a place of rupture. Um, it's a place where we constantly expect something to just burst out of the depths. We are west of the west, as one of our historians put it. Beyond this point, there's just ocean. Um, so you got to make it work here, or you got to go somewhere else. Um, we're an edgy people. <laughs> so um, I said, you know, and it's always been that way for us. I was born here. There have been people who were living here for many thousands of years, way before any of us got here. And I, I've talked to them about this, and it's the same for some of them, too. We expect to have to balance on, on shifting surfaces mm -hmm. down in the depths of our psyche. And, it freaks out some of us, and others like me sleep through earthquakes, you know. So that's part of our character as it's informed by the land. So the, in, the terror psychological inquiry basically comes down to, and it's on one of these handouts here, uh, place assessment is a, is a complicated way of saying what I'm telling you right now. <clears throat> to look at landscapes and their history as a series of metaphors that bridge the ecological and the psychological. And if you can interpret dreams or stories or myths, you can do the same work with place. It's not that difficult. So that's my terror psychology piece. That's what we do. Um, we have an anthology called Rebirths that is 28 of us doing this work in very different ways. Um, even with objects, with neighborhoods, all kinds of things. It's really interesting. But the, the upshot of it for me is it, it um, uh, kind of gives me a contemporary way of understanding that I live in an animate world. Mm. Uh, a world which I'm always in conversation with. And that has completely changed my worldview. So, in, interpreting landscapes like dreams, that's a good way of putting it really quickly. Um, so the second piece, myth. Uh, pr you probably know that, um, if you've studied this at all, that myth is a lot more than ideology. 
it can be it can be used as such. And in fact, when I teach the archetypal myth class here, I mentioned to the students up front that part of our work will be to keep the myths alive and hear what they have to say because when we try to interpret them in only one way, then we ideologize them and that kills them. The story is, is flattened when we do that. And so myths in a way, <clears throat> you could think of as the dreams of a people. So just as individuals have dreams, entire cultures have myths. And they can be interpreted similarly too. So I wrote a piece at, um, at Huffington Post that appeared somewhere between the celebrity runway fail stories and the side boob pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a piece on um, the zombie apocalypse thing that keeps going around in the movies and all that. I get, as a depth psychologist, I get asked questions like this all the time, you know, what does the zombie apocalypse mean? So I gave my own interpretation. <laughs> it's a fun job. <laughs> so I gave my own interpretation and it's not the only one available. There's been lots of pretty creative writing about this actually and some nice artwork too. But um, <clears throat> that would be an example of a modern myth with ancient roots. And that's the thing about modern myths. They always seem to have plots and images that go way back. They don't just start spontaneously. So um, Jung wrote a piece on UFOs at the, at the end of his life. He got really fascinated by them. And he didn't much care whether they were real or not. He just thought they were psychologically interesting. So. He wrote a bunch of, he actually wrote a paper that turned into a book called um, UFOs, A Modern Myth in the Sky. So, <laughs> we need some UFO pictures. But, um, so myths are, are always with us and it, you know, if you're at all tuned into the, the mass media, you know that there's shows all the time. The Marvel movies that are coming out one after another, um, Game of Thrones and all these other things. All the days of the week are named after mythic figures. The planets are named after mythic figures. Um, there's all kinds of interesting myths, uh, old stories, now coming out of many different corners of the world. And when I teach the myth class, I give people myths from many cultures, not just the, the Greek and Roman or the European ones. Um, there's, they, they hold, um, because they compensate for the shortcomings of collective consciousness, they hold bits of wisdom that if you can get down to, are actually very interesting in terms of how they now inform us. And so. As a, a quick example of that, um, there, so in, in my myth class, we, we looked a little bit at a myth about a wisdom goddess whose name is Nuwa. Um, she's Chinese. And so there's, a, there's an old story that uh, there was a monster called Gong Gong. And he got pissed off one day for various reasons. He was rebelling against the authorities of heaven. And so he got mad enough that he took his forehead and he crashed it into a mountain. Uh, Mount Buzo in China, and he destroyed it. And so unfortunately, this was one of the mountains that holds up the sky. So the entire sky went dark. There was no sunlight anymore, and it crashed down to the earth, causing chaos and warfare and civic unrest and things like that. <clears throat> so at that point of the story, um, we talked about it in class a little bit, and I was really fortunate because I had three students who grew up in China and came here to study. So they, they heard this myth growing up as part of their, their own experience. And so we, they, were, they were instantly the experts on it. And we said, what, what, what does this mean to you? you know? <clears throat> and they talked about how um, Nu was a very familiar uh, figure in Chinese mythology. Everybody grows up hearing about her and how she created, some say she created earth, some say she created human beings or both. Mo in most stories, she created human beings. Um, she's associated with serpents, and in some pictures she has the tail of a serpent. And this is actually an archetypal theme. It's specific to Chinese culture in the way that it shows up. But the serpent goddess, who's a goddess of wisdom, is found in many different pantheons. And we could call her Sophia. Um, Athena's original name meant serpent woman. Um, Sihuacoat in the Aztec pantheon, you know, many different names. And she's always involved in creative activity of some kind or another. So, and the Chinese students mentioned that Mount Buzo, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly, it, it means something specific in one of the Chinese languages. It means collective effort. Hmm. So this monster destroyed the foundation of collect, collective effort and brought the sky down. So 
Um, I've, I've floated the idea with them. What if this myth is alive now and Gong Gong looks like extractive industry energies destroying mountaintops in China? And of course here in Appalachia and other places, you know, this is going on all over the world. Does that not have the same effect? When you, when you wreck these mountains and pollute the air, I mean, if you go to Beijing, you can see exactly what it looks like. The sky really has fallen there. So in the next part of the story, <clears throat> Nuwa shows up, and she, it's up to her to fix this mess that's been created. So she, um, she uses, makes use of a turtle through a, an elaborate procedure I won't go into, and she basically uses the legs of the turtle to put the sky back up where it belongs. So in the class, we talked a little bit about where is Nuwa today? Because we sure need her. You know, where is she happening today? Is she in alternative energies? Is she in um, movements in China that push away from coal and oil? Um, where is Nuwa? Is she in what Von Dana Shiva calls the need, for the, return, the, the need for the return of the sacred feminine? So those are all questions that we were sitting with in the class. But um, that might be an example of a myth that has come back to life in our time. Um, th the myths tend to, they show up with very similar elements, but each time they, they surface, they require fresh understandings. Um, their foundations are inexhaustible, unlike those of the mountains that we're, that we're wrecking. So there's always a new um, co-creation of mythic stories, a new invention that, that needs to happen too, if we're really to understand what they say to us. So how does that relate to place? Um, let's see, what's a good... I'm struggling to encapsulate what I usually teach through a whole semester. <laughs> uh, if, you're a, if you're a grinding sound, it's my brain. Um, <laughs> so maybe a good way to say it is just how, what I do when I go out somewhere. Um, uh, so the angels and, and whoever else is in Los Angeles is an example. I'm, I'm, I'm floating the idea that a myth, the reason it arises in a specific place and we tend to forget this when we read myth books because you can pick up a book on African myths or on uh, Asian myths or whatever it is and there's nothing in the book usually about where the, the specific cultures and the specific lands where these stories came from. It's just, oh, isn't this a great story, you know? <clears throat> but the myths seem to be very specific even though they have potentially universal implications when we read them and learn from them. You know, the myths of Athena would be impossible without the Acropolis. They would make no sense, and the same with the Olympians. <clears throat> Ele is almost unimaginable outside West Africa. So there's, there's a connection already, and, it, and the idea that we're floating in this terapsychological work is that, among other things, a myth is a co-creation between people and place. In other words, it gives us a sense of our relationship to the non-human. And that's why so often myths are about deities and gods and sometimes nature deities too. Um, I would argue that ultimately all the deities are nature deities of one kind or another. But um, So the myth can make visible our relationship to the non-human. And the great e example of this, of course, is from Japan when they talk about kami and how there are specific spirits of place in Kyoto, in Tokyo, in this corner of the woods, in that temple and they each have different needs. So this idea that we call mythological is actually, it's alive and well for one thing, but um, it comes up in all different cultures before industrialization, scientific materialism, and things like that. All our ancestors took it seriously. And so I heard um, Vine Deloria um, in an interview before he died talking about the Sioux attitude about this. And there was a particular, um, uh, plateau in, in Sioux territory that the Sioux were trying to um, protect against climbers during a certain type of year, especially destructive climbers who would use those, you know, they would drive pitons into the sacred mountain, things like that. So the, and the Sioux were, um, their attitude was, we don't, we don't mind if you, if you climb the thing, just don't make holes in it for one thing. And for another, don't climb it when we're having ceremonies there. Obviously, you know, I'm, how hard is that to understand? So it was a big legal battle, and um, what interested me about it was a comment, one of the things was a comment that Vine Deloria made, um, Sue Elder, author of many books, <coughs> scholar, 
he said, you know, our, our medicine people have been listening to this, this mound for more time than anybody's been on this continent except other native people. And we know what it needs. We know what the place needs and wants. And you're disrupting an ancient set of relationships that we have cultivated, you know, for time out of mind. So that's part of our problem with this, you know. So there's an example of how a sacred story, to use a different word than myth, weds people to the landscape. It's actually probably one of the original, I hate to use the word function because it sounds so imposed and, and weird, but it's probably one of the original dynamics, let me put it that way of what a myth actually does. It relates us to the non-human forces of the world and of the cosmos. <clears throat> but then after centuries, it, the, our understanding of it changes. Some people take it over for ideological purposes. They oppress other people with it, and then they've killed it. Um, but the good news is it can be brought back to life. So where this is relevant is, um, and I, by the way, I gave you some quotations about myths that I won't read you because of, of time. You can take them home and read them. But um, where this is relevant to the work that I do is um, my impression from running all over California and other places, um, including England, is that it's as though, oh, what's a good way of saying this? It's as though to a specific landscape belongs a specific mythic figure. And it's, there, there's many different mythic figures that show up in many different landscapes, but there seems to be one main one, one big one, who kind of organizes all the rest. And I think it's because a particular landscape tends to have one main feature. It's a valley, or it's, it's some kind of watershed, or it's a mountaintop, or it's a desert, or whatever. Um, so as, a, as an example of this, um, when I um, spent some time out in Death Valley, <coughs> um, I kept running into all the, and studying the place historically as I was spending time out there myself, I kept running into the trickster all over the place. And not just in the stories of the Mojave and the native people out there, although trickster was big in those stories too, you know. But I mean actual encounters, you know. So if you study the history of, Moha of um, um, not just the Mojave Desert, but specifically Death Valley, um, there's a number of people who have gone in there to try to extract minerals from the place who came to really bizarre bad ends. <laughs> really, like a huge wind came along and blew all their stuff down, and then they had to walk out of the desert, you know. I mean, strange stuff, you know, so, and much more bizarre than that. <clears throat> so it's as to, uh, an indigenous way of saying it would be, it's as though Trickster owns the desert, not us, you know. And you really see that out there. And also, there's a lot of stories that have, have to do with fire and also death, hence the name Death Valley. In many different mythologies, Trickster is the figure who brings death and fire into the world. Whether we call him Prometheus, or a rabbit, or a crow, or... Um, Hermes or Mercury or any of them. The, um, sex, death, and fire, they, those tend to be three things that they always bring into the world. Usually in ways that are, that are hilarious to read about <laughs> and to hear about when you can hear a good storyteller talk about them. Sex, death, and fire. So <clears throat> I, my guess would be that there's a bit of that out in Black Rock, you know. You'll, let, you'll have to let me know about that. <laughs> I want to hear about that. but. So, um, but I don't, I actually don't think that Trickster is necessarily the main being who's out there. So we'll get to that in a second. So, um, Trickster seems to own Death Valley. And uh, by the way, um, when you're investigating kind of the, the presence of a place in this way, who's here, you know, who, what's the mythic energy that's here? Usually, it will happen to you which is one of the reasons I always caution people when they do this kind of work. They go out and listen to places and ask the place for dreams and stuff like that. You can have a really bad experience doing that. Um, I've known people who have. I knew a guy who, Matt Cochran, who actually went out to um, Trinity because he was curious about what the place made of being an atomic bomb testing ground. And he had horrible nightmares. <clears throat> had to camp out in the back country for a month just to get his feet back on the ground. But. Um, a, mi a very mild example of this. Um, so I, I was, during one part of my traveling through there, I had a lot of work that I was bringing with me that I had to take along. And 
I had some, t you know, part of my time in Death Valley set aside just for the place, and the other part was set aside for work. So I called this um, uh, place to stay in Death Valley, and I said, you guys got wireless? Yes, we do, no problem. Um, good, you have a place to work? Yeah, no problem. I said, all right. So I get there, I um, unpack all my stuff. There's no wireless. And, and there, from all indications, there had never been any, right? <laughs> it was like an out-and-out -out lie. So it was, it, it, <laughs> there was no phone, you know. But the more I was there, the more I started to like it, you know. <laughs> I thought, okay, no work, you know. So it forced me to pay full attention in the time that I had to the place itself without work or any other distractions getting in the way. So it, it came out really good, you know. Now, usually we would think of that as a synchronicity. <clears throat> but what if a synchronicity, at least some of them, are actually some sort of a, a message or a gesture from the place itself? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Instead of being so, a, an immutable cosmic law, what if it's more like a manner of discourse or speaking or a style of being, you know? Um, so anyway, um, that was definitely a trickster happening. There were other ones I had when I was out there, too. And also on the other side of it, um, there was a really rare blue moon that was unusually large, and I hadn't planned this at all. Um, when I went out walking, there was a whole bunch of photographers out there with me, and they were photographing this magnificent moon that came up over the peaks. And I went, oh, wow, this is, this is a miracle just to be able to see this here in Death Valley. You know, it was incredible. So there's the other side of trickster, making opportunities. You know? So if, I, if we were to say it in, <clears throat> um, let's say, mythological terms, I wonder about Mars and Venus, to, to use the European terms, in Los Angeles. Um, I wonder about um, Hades and the underworld gods in Monterey, where off the coast are the deepest underwater canyons on the Pacific coast, um, like 100 feet off the coast, you know. So it's a, excuse me, it's a place of great depth. And um, Hades and Pluto aren't just death gods, they're also depth gods. Mm -hmm. By the way, there's a lot of suicides out there too, traditionally. A lot in Carmel, especially. Mm -hmm. um, so some people do the underworld literally instead of going into it artistically or psychologically, you know. But it seems like Places always come with their, the, the ancient Romans called it a genius loci, a spirit of place. <clears throat> and all cultures have some term for this. So that's the myth part. Um, which myths pop up in which places and actually give us a, a more intense and conscious experience of the landscape? So that when we tend the story, we can tend the actual features of the land and also tend how it actually feels to us and gets into us. I was walking um, near above Santa Barbara. You know, if you look at a map of California, it seems to like bend like this along the coast. So right at that bend, um, that's Point Conception. <clears throat> and it's an interesting name because the Shumash who live there say that um, that's the actual portal to the underworld, or excuse me, to the other world. And so when people die, According to Shumash belief, their souls go through the gateway at Point Conception. So the place that's named Conception is also the place of transmission to the underworld. Mm -hmm. And the amount of accidents, fatal accidents, at Point Conception is amazing. Mm -hmm. There was an entire squadron of destroyers that destroyed itself on the rocks one foggy morning. <clears throat> um, countless galleons have been sunk there. There's contrary currents in the water. That, that mix things up and make it hard to sail through there sometimes. And when I was there, before I knew any of this history, I remember walking on the beach and feeling like my legs were so heavy that I thought I was coming down with something. But I think it was my unconscious, well, semi-conscious reaction to the, the, the place itself. It's, it's a place of down or through or whatever it is. There was somebody who wanted to make a spaceport there. So again, an unconscious reaction to the place itself. Um, so that's a bit about terror psychology and then also a bit about myth. So now to get specific about Black Rock Desert. Um, let's see, where did I, how am I doing on time by the way? Okay. Um, 
Let me go through the, before I get to that, let me go quickly through this handout just so you know what's in here. So I mentioned a bunch of quotes about myth that I think open it up as a deeper presence. Um, there's a handout called Terra Psychology that's like a, a, an encapsulation of what I just told you. And it also has some really specific suggestions for how to do this. So if you take it with you when you go out to Burning Man, try out a few of these and see what happens. Like things like watching your body, how you feel out there, watching your dreams, um, stuff like that. There's another exercise. Um, we do it in my planetary psychology class. It's called Archetypes in Nature. And it's a way of uh, being aware of the patterns and shapes that are around you in a landscape. The, one of the miraculous things about the natural world is it's organized on relatively few simple patterns. So I, I um, got a, a certificate in permaculture a while back, and I remember our instructor saying, go out somewhere and make a sketch of all the simple patterns that you see. Circles, nets, branchings, you know, and there was only like 30 or 40 of them. I mean, it was a fixed number, you know. And yet with these simple patterns, the natural world is endlessly creative in what it produces. It's just amazing. And across all scales, whether it's the spiral in the, in the sink or spiral galaxies, it's just, it's just endlessly creative. And then the, la the last handout here is the, a piece that's a little more elaborate on um, assessing a place terror psychologically. So you'll have that. And if, um, feel free to email me questions if you have any about any of this, this stuff. So um, when I go to a place, um, I look at the, the terrain first, the geology, the ecology, and, and I look at it as a landscape of moving metaphors. So I always start with the land. And I think about the land psychologically. Then I turn to stories, um, happenings there, history, things like that. And I look for points of connection. And I know I'm on the wrong track if I don't see them. So like I was in, um, I was in Orange County for a while looking that place over. And um, I, thought, I thought I had a pretty good idea of what the basic mythology of Orange County was in terms of the place itself and what happens there. So I was writing about it one night and I went to bed and I had a dream about a woman that I had actually had a relationship with in Orange County at one time. And, um, she, but it wasn't quite her and very often in dreams you, you might think you're dreaming about some person in your life but a way that a dream informs you that it's not them is it makes them a little different. That's a hint that it's, it's, this is you or terapsychologically the place, you know. Um, one of the things we've learned is that places often show up as personified figures in dreams. It's amazing. It, it's, it's, it totally changed how I look at dreams or added, added a layer to it, let me put it that way. So in the dream, a person I associate with Orange County shows up and she's got this, this thick bunch of stuff and she like hands it to me like this and I realize it's my writing about Orange County and it's full of red marks all the way through like start over you know and so I woke up and I went hmm I'm probably completely wrong about this place <laughs> you know judging from my dreams and at this point I'd, I had had a lot of dreams cueing me in on what's happening in different places before I went to San Luis Obispo I had a dream um, that I saw a part of the place a landscape between ma the mountains, or the hills rather, with the word contaminated across it. And when I got there, I kept hearing about oil spills and um, uh, ecological invasions of Morro Bay and the creek in front of the mission was too polluted to walk in and one thing after another. So I've, I've come to think of that less as a personal thing than as the place itself. I'm, I'm part of its system after all. I mean, we're, we're not totally separate from these places. We're part of whatever makes them go. So, of course, they would be able to um, give us this kind of information in dreams. <clears throat> so I make use of that. So um, 
let's see here. So um, with all of those, I like to, to try to get a sense of where the story parallels the place itself. And if there are parallels like that, then I'm, I'm pr pretty sure I'm on the right trail. <clears throat> and one other thing before I mention Black Rock Desert, um, my, my mythological training originally was in European mythology, um, especially Greek, Roman, and Celtic. So that's a basic language for me. But of course, um, there are way more mythologies than those, <laughs> and equally as important. So if I were to say something like, well, I'll give you an example. Um, I was up north of here around the Klamath River area, and I kept noticing the presence of the, to say it archetypally, there was a lot of serpent imagery going on um, all over the place, in carvings, in people's stories, in my dreams. And so I was thinking of it a little bit um, as the, the world serpent that shows up in the mythology of my Norse ancestors, um, the one that Thor eventually fights with at the end of the world. But my thought about it was, all right, but this is a European creation. So if there's really something here, it should be reflected in the native mythology. So I checked with somebody who lived up there and who is an active member of the, of the Kurok tribe. And I said, are there any stories that you're able to tell me about involving serpents? And he went, ah, oh, that's like one of our main beings up here, you know. And he told me this whole story about um, a serpent that initiates people and it swims through the Klamath River and it goes out to the ocean and it's very elaborate. It's, it's a focus of rites of more than one tribe in the Klamath area. <clears throat> so what that told me was, um, so I, I have my Euro version of this, but there's something here that's, that transcends my own mythological labeling. There's something here that, that really is showing up, you know. So I'm mentioning all that because I'm going to describe the European version of who I think is in Black Rock Desert. But be aware that the native people obviously held it really differently. So if this is anywhere near correct, then the, the northern Paiutes should have a member of their, their deity who's like the figure I'm going to mention. If they're different, then probably all this is wrong. Because <laughs> they've been there. They're, they know what's, what, what's there, you know. So um, what I'm going to do before I mention that mythic figure is I'm going to give you a little sketch of the land. And I'm going to ask for your help in thinking about it psychologically. So this is where you get to uh, exercise a little bit of this stuff that I've been talking about. So here's the first one of the features of the Black Rock Desert. <clears throat> there are lava beds in layers, many different layers. And the place itself is a deep, it's a playa, it's, a, um, it's a, an ancient lake bed below high peaks. So if this were in a person, what would it look like psychologically? In other words, how would you describe this in metaphor? Anybody? <laughs> um, the layers make me think of somebody who is either uh, very old or has had uh, lives. Yeah. Maybe a, a person that has gone through reincarnations. Mm -hmm. And um, it's tempting to think of the lake bed as something that would be like pressed or low because everything else yeah. is high, but somehow that doesn't sound right. It's an interesting contrast. Mm -hmm. What would that look like in a person? A, a, a really solid low that's way down there and, and peaks. Yeah, <laughs> manic depression. <laughs> yeah, it, woo, woo, right? Extremes of experience. Not necessarily a psychiatric thing, but you know, extremes of experience. Extreme highs and lows. <clears throat> so if we're translating this, if we're anywhere near accurate about human experience, we would expect extremes of experience in this place because of how it actually is. By the way, that dynamic appears in this city. The guy who platted the city, who, who gridded it, <coughs> Jasper O'Farrell, um, he got drunk, well I was going to say he got drunk one night, but it was much more than one night. And um, instead of doing the sensible thing, which would be to build roads on contours so people could actually get to the top of the hills here, he went, 
I think I'll just run them right up the hill. <laughs> so people had to walk until they invented cable cars out of mining skips. So the cars that you see in movies or actually have seen in person deep in mines, those are where cable cars come from. So, so the city geologically is a mood swing, you know. Um, yeah. And lake bed is like fire and water. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, an extreme. And in fact, there are many geysers out here. Many geysers. <clears throat> Continuous hot pressure from below. <laughs> Sounds like some of our relationships, actually. <laughs> so that's a, a, key fig, a key feature of this landscape. It's always under pressure. It's always wanting to erupt. Um, and so let me pair that with a few examples. Um, there are land speed races in this area. So bursts of crazy speed, reckless driving. There's rocketry out there, Air Force gunnery. So like Trinity, it's a place of explosions and eruptions and geysers. If you, um, if you look at the Black Rock Desert on a map, sometimes you can get a sense of the place by being a little fanciful about how it looks on a map. Um, to my imagination, it looks like an outburst of flame. So have a look at it yourself and see if, if that seems right. <clears throat> um, there are rocks out there um, that are they're geodes. So they're a rock with a crystal in the center. They're called thunder eggs. <laughs> we seem to be in a pattern. Um, they're like geodes, but they have an irregular center, like the place itself. They're more, they're more like an, a burst, you know. Um, so that's, that's one part of all this. Under pressure, geysers, explosions, extremes of temperature. Now, the pl it also seems like a place of reverie at the same time. So, for instance, if you look throughout the playa, there's all these really imaginative names, place names. And there are things like Virgin Valley, Massacre Lake, Smoke Creek Desert, Sentinel Hills, Sheephead Mountains. <clears throat> and the place is subject, by the way, to sudden what are called playa serpents. Have you heard of these? Mm -hmm. have, you ever, have you seen one? No. What are they like? Well, <laughs> playa serpents, we, they are also referred to as dunes that sort of... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd like to see one sometime. There are um, optical illusions out there. People have said that cars in the distance look like airplanes flying low over the over the ground. <coughs> um, the northern Paiute people who live there say that this is the, one of the homes of Thunderbird, which makes sense. It fits all the themes that we've been talking about. Um, I'm guessing they have another de deity that I didn't have time to find out about, and he's coming up in a minute. Um, as another, as a cultural example of some of this, there was a film made in 1955 called um, Bad Day at Black Rock. Mm. And in the film, there was a guy named McCready, and he was looking for somebody else, and he drives to Adobe Flats, where he finds a homestead that's been burned to the ground, <clears throat> and uh, surrounded by lots of wildflowers. So again, these two things together, destruction and creation all together. Um, he ends up setting the bad guy on fire with a Molotov cocktail. So you can see the themes of the place infiltrating what happens. <clears throat> um, it's also the birthplace, oddly enough, of something called a fairy shrimp, which is a very mythological sounding beast to me that swims upside down. <laughs> It's uh, referred to online as the most archetypal of crustaceans. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> sounds, it sounds really cool, though. <laughs> and they have really short lives. And this theme of, sh of sh temporary and short and, and punctuation and all that will come up again um, as we go. And then um, I have an alchemical thought that I wanted to give you. Um, a lot of the rock out there really is black, hence the name of the desert. So in alchemical thought, um, 
this reminds me a lot of a substance that's called the um, prime matter, prima materia. And the significance psychologically, according to Carl Jung, is that the prime matter is the stuff that you start the operation with. Nobody knows exactly what it is, and there's all these really interesting alchemical pictures and woodcuts and stories about how, where you find it. But one place you never find it is in the city or in temples. You find it in the low places. <clears throat> so Jung took that to mean the prime matter is the low places in you. Things that you haven't resolved, old wounds, gaps in your personality, ruptures, that's where you find the prime matter that creates the, the fabulous philosopher's stone that can heal all that. So um, if an alchemist went out to Black Rock, that person, whether they knew young or not, would probably say, wow, this place is full of prime matter. There must be a lot of alchemy going on out here. So that's the place. Now I want to bring a myth in, and you'll be the judge of wh whether it matches or not, especially when you really go out there and see for yourself. So um, in terms of the mythology of Burning Man, which I, I haven't really had time to look into, um, a couple of things have come up. Um, one that comes up is the Wicker Man, who was burned by the ancient Gaulish Druids. So that's a figure who, who shows. But there was another one who I thought might be even more appropriate, and that would be the figure, in European terms anyway, of Dionysus. So I want to tell you a little about him. <clears throat> he was actually a god who was born in fire. And one of his monikers was um, Dionysus Pyrigenes, which means born in fire. Um, his mother was burned up in the process of him being born. And he's associated consistently with fire in different stories. Um, there used to be a, a giant Dionysian mystery that people would attend every now and then. So listen to what this sounds like. When you go to the Dionysian mystery ceremony, there's a drama of some kind. There are altered states, so there was not, there was not just um, drinking, but also entheogenic work going on, people ingesting plants. Um, there were menads who were the, the feminine followers of Dionysus, who would e engage in ecstatic dances and dress up in costumes and wear masks. Um, the themes that came up in the ceremonies were intoxication, celebration, madness, death, and rebirth, and it was usually held someplace between the city and the country. So it was held in a liminal threshold space. Um, <clears throat> the ceremonies, I mentioned substances and wine. Uh, there was a death rebirth theme that went on. There was a lot of things being burned. Um, torches, masks, temporary temples. So they would, they would build these incredible worship spaces for ceremony and celebration and then they would take them down again and leave. There was no fixed location for the Dionysi Dionysian mysteries. Um, ecstatic dancing, and there was never a fixed hierarchy overseeing any of this. There was no group of priests or menads or whomever. It, it ran itself. Um, I should mention also, um, in terms of, am I pronouncing this right, caravansaries? So, what a great word. We need to bring that, well, we are bringing that word back. Um, so Dionysus was a god of travel. Um, wherever he went, the, these centers of cultural exchange would spring up, and people would gather around fires to share common stories uh, in remembrance of Dionysian energies that he represents. Think of, him, think of him not so much, there's a tendency in the West to think of these as really literal gods. Think of them more as archetypal energies ways of being, styles of, of being in touch with the sacred, and also uh, ways of being in nature. So um, there was also a place called um, Zerzura, which was a, an Egyptian city of Dionysus. And he founded an oracle out in the Libyan desert. So Dionysus also has a strong association to deserts and prophetic work that goes on outside in those places. So look for a sign that says Zerzura when you're at Burning Man. <laughs> um, what else did I want to say about him? Okay, so um, Carolyn's going to actually send you a cast of characters to look for. 
<laughs> um, one, of the, one of the things that provides a check on these mythic fantasies of place is do the, do the, does the cast really show up? You know, do the people in the story actually make an appearance? So um, some people to look for, of course, would be Dionysus himself, the god of intoxication, altered states, drama, <laughs> redemption. He was also a death god, a god of the underworld, especially according to Heraclitus. So look for him, born in thunder and fire, known in Rome as Bacchus. Where would we find that at Burning Man? I don't know. Um, look for his, his partner, actually. I've been talking a lot about him. I should mention them as a couple. So Ariadne, um, the goddess of the labyrinth. And anything convoluted and labyrinthine and initiatory. And she's particularly a goddess of elaborate structures. Um, if you see that movie Inception, there's actually a character in it named Ar Ariadne who fits this. And she builds amazing elaborate dream structures. So where Ar Ariadne shows up and the dream structures get built, that's her energy rather than that of her partner. Um, look for Persephone, who's the seductive goddess of the underworld, of death, but also of spring. Um, there's a few others. I'm not going to go through the whole list because you'll, you'll get a copy of it. But um, Oh, here's one I should mention. Look for Semele. Um, she's the mother of Dionysus. And a um, couple of things about her. One is, in Rome, she had a name called Stimula. <laughs> and she was, in Rome, she was known as the goddess of goads and whips. So have a look for her. <laughs> uh, Semele, S -M, you'll, and you'll get a copy of this, uh, S-E-M-E-L-E. -E. She went up in a burst of flame when Dionysus was born. <clears throat> um, and there's all kinds of other characters who might show up. Um, also the Menads, the, the female priestesses of Dionysus, look for them. So a um, couple of questions, and if I have time, I'll take a few of your questions too. But um, these are some, some things to hold when you go out there, just a few of them. One is, uh, why would Dionysus, or whatever he represents in whatever terminology you're comfortable with, because he has counterpoints in all cultures, why would this energy of ecstasy, death, rebirth, whatever it is, show up for me at this time in my life and education? Why do I need to encounter this now? That's the other great thing about place. You know, if there's a, if there's a particular energy out there, there's a good chance you have need of it for some reason. It has something for you. Why Dionysian energy just now? Um, another question would be, what character am I in the myth? Do I relate more to him? Am I a Menad? Am I Zeus, his father? Ariadne? Another question, um, what at a deep level is being celebrated and ritualized out here? How is the place itself participating? What for me is being burned or burning up? And then um, one last thought I'll leave you with and I'll stop um, and ask for questions if we have time. Burning Man itself, the idea of caravansaries, is it possible that these are a foreshadowing of how we're actually going to have to live on an, on an overheating planet? Mm. Now, to say it a little bit less apocalyptically, is at some deep level is Burning Man and everything that it represents a series of experiments for how to creatively live in a very uncertain future. How to make community in places of, of rupture. And with that,
Do I have time for questions? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Hey, I like very much. Ah, thank you. Um, what you said about the history, is this on? Yes. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. About the history of a place and yeah. how that can affect our relationships, our psyche, what actually occurs. So is there a possibility that a group of people with this understanding and this education can come together and rework that? and yes. not repeat history absolutely and yeah. make a new future i'm so glad you asked that um it, it works the same way as with myth if you're stuck in a myth it has you and that's a disaster um, if you think of princess diana living out the myth of diana in a negative way um, the one thing that Di i mean this would be bad for any woman but for diana in particular to hand her authority over to men like the ones that she was surrounded with is deadly so she ended up actually living out an episode from the Diana story involving a, a, a hunter that she um, ordered torn to pieces by his own hounds. Only she lived it out unconsciously, so she herself was the victim. Um, John Denver plunged into Monterey Bay. He was, he was working um, or being worked by Icarus, the one who flew too high. He took off in an experimental plane one day after um, leaving these um, messages on relatives voicemail about flight and um, other Ikarian themes, you know, and plunged into the bay. So to live a myth is, it can be disastrous. And the same with the presence of a place too, more for some people than others, I think. Um, what seems to happen is the more you work with the place and the more you work with myth itself, um, it, there, there's something about this, the place and the story that wants to be reimagined. Otherwise, there's no real point to it, you know, recurring. And I often think of both as, um, Psychical, psychically active beings who actually exist as in the world, of the world. And so there's a softening that occurs when you begin working with them. Um, in my myth class, there's a piece we do on personal myth, and I, I ask students to look up pretty deeply the roots of your names. And I'm following Jung's assumption here that we come into a specific mythic story and that our names can have a hint of it, and also the circumstances of our birth. So, you know, if you come in um, as, let's say, Venus or Aphrodite, and you're married to Hephaestus, only in this life he looks like an engineer who never pays any attention to you, <clears throat> that's not a good recipe for a healthy relationship. But if you know that about yourself, then you can make different choices. So it's, it, it softens the story itself. I think that's why um, a lot of these old mythic stories, when they get retold, there's always something a bit different about them as they play out, which I think is a good thing. So King Arthur doesn't always marry Guinevere. Sometimes he's, he ends up with a lady in the lake or somebody else, you know. That's, that's a good thing. So, and in the same way, the, the place itself, um, you, it, what's a good way of saying this quickly? When you know what's going on there, then it puts you in a it's it, it puts you in a position similar to when you know what your own unconscious dynamics are to some extent. You never know fully, but if you know you have a particular wound somewhere, then you know. Let's say you meet somebody that you're very attracted to, and it's the same kind of person in many ways that you're always attracted to. Then you can go, I've been down this road before. <laughs> maybe this is not a good choice, or maybe I need to do this again so I learn some, something else. You know. But in any case, you can stand back from it a little bit and do things differently. And, and this is a little metaphysical, but I like to think that places actually get something out of being treated differently. Mm -hmm. So I actually have a lot of affection for all the places I've been to, even when they don't really suit my character. Um, and I have a connection to them that I wasn't able to have before and also to the earth as a whole. So there's a really great essay by Alice Walker where she says, um, when I appreciate the wildflowers that come out one year, then next year there are twice as many of them. <laughs> and when I talk to the deer who know that they need never fear me, then there's more next time around, you know. So th there's, when you do this sort of thing, you arrive at a point where it starts to become a conversation between you and the place and the world. It's, it's really lovely and moving in some ways. And it, it takes you to a very different destination. Thank so. you. Yeah. Do we have one more question? 
I have two questions sure. briefly. One is, how much do you work with David Abram? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we've corresponded, mm -hmm. and we read each other's books, mm -hmm. um, but that's the extent of it. Okay, so. and are you familiar with uh, John Battista Vico? Yeah, um, yeah a, a little bit. Okay, yeah. he's a 17th century yeah. Italian metaphysician. Neo he was a Neoplatonist, I think. Or may no, I'm thinking of somebody else. He, but yeah, Vico. He wrote the New Science, yes, yes. which is uh, yeah. a sort of anti-Cartesian rationality, replacing it with poetic yeah. wisdom. Um, there's a lot on memory and myth and metaphor tropes, yeah. uh, the art of topics, fables in brief. Yeah, um, interesting stuff. The um, incidentally, I'm not. Um, against all forms of science or, or even positivism, but what we try to do terra-psychologically is get to the story behind the numbers. So it's a fact that there was a ranch in Escondido sold for a certain amount of money, and that's, that's data, you know, so there's no turning against that. But if you know that it was a place called Rancho Diablo, and that it was sold for $666.60, then it, then it takes on a different character. So there are ways to deepen the literal relationships and the causal stuff, so, yeah. I know we're out of time, but um, so I'm, if we want to do a little more research about um, this Dionysus and the different uh, archetypal energies that he takes on, what are some other examples in other cultures that we can also ground into? You could have a look at Krishna. Okay. Um, let's see, who else? Um, Attis, A-T-T-I-S, Orpheus, I'm trying to think of, of non-European ones though. I'd have to, my brain's, my brain's still on summer break. <laughs> um, I'll think of some and then I'll, you know what I'll do is actually I have a running file where, where I kind of um, like uh, ecstasy and redemption, God and goddess. So I'll, I'll send that to, to you and I guess you can just, you know. Fantastic. So yeah, for all across cultures. So. Wonderful. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Any? Do we have time for one more? Uh. All right. Thank you, well, thank you.